Hello, everyone. I want to thank Elsevier for inviting me to come and speak to you all today. Can you hear me okay? As you can see, my topic today is to talk about the use of the Committee on Publication Ethics as editorial support. But I think it's a little broader than that because actually anyone here who reads a journal, writes a manuscript, submits a manuscript, can make use of the COPE guidelines. Even if you're not directly a member, much of the information is free online and very useful to anyone who's doing any publication issues. I want to talk um, a little bit about who I am. I, I am here in the capacity as a, um, an elected member of the COPE Council. Um, and just to give you a little history of this, I'm a Wiley Blackwell journal editor. I'm the editor of Perspectives in Psychiatric Care, which is an advanced practice nursing journal um, for psychiatric nurses. And I have been that editor for just over four years. And I, I have to give you a little story here to tell you how I got involved with COPE. I, I have to preface this by saying, though, I grew up in the Midwest. And I don't know if that means anything to people, but I grew up in a very conservative, Christian, family where you know what's right, you know what's wrong, you live your life that way, and there's really no questions about the gray area, per se. I, hear, I see people shaking their heads, they know what I'm talking about. I, so I, I certainly uh, harken back to those roots a lot, although I don't think a lot of people know that so much about me. But I took over this role as a journal editor, and you know, I realized after all this event occurred that got me involved with COPE, that I actually assumed that everybody else pretty much functions the same way, which is not right. I, sh I was naive. I should have realized that that's not always true. I think it's true most of the time. But about 18 months ago, I got this call from a reviewer on my uh, review panel, who's also an editorial board member, and she called me from the West Coast. She had gotten up early in the morning to get a hold of me, and she was appalled because she said a paper that I had sent to her for review she said, you have to look at this paper. She said, this person has systematically altered the references on three quarters of the refs in this paper. And what the author had done was to systematically add 10 or 20 years to both the volume number and the year um, on the references. I had never heard of that before. And I talked with my managing editor about it, and she said, well, we have to contact Cope. She said, we have to do a case. And I knew what COPE was, but I hadn't really tapped into it that much. So we wrote up the case, because I called this author and I spoke to him. He blamed his graduate students, which I thought was really tacky. <laughs> but he blamed them, and he said that his dean had, he told his dean, and his dean had said that in fact he could do a, a in-service for the faculty on EndNote, and that would take care of the problem. And then I got curious, and I went back into PubMed, and I pulled up his other, some of his other papers. Every paper this gentleman had wrote, had written, had been systematically altered in terms of the references. And they were published. These were published in the professional literature. So we ended up presenting the case at COPE, and they didn't have many guidelines on what to do when people have systematically altered references. But they came up with some, some recommendations to us, one of which was to get the legal department of Wiley Blackwell involved, which of course we did right away. And then we started looking into other Wiley Blackwell publications. And the bottom line, I think, that is important to mention is that this gentleman ended up with seven papers that were retracted. And I don't know if any of you ever look at Retraction Watch, but there were seven manuscripts that had been published that were retracted. It's the largest number of professional nursing manuscripts that have ever been retracted from one author. It's a real blight on our on our profession, it was really bad, because his topic was lesbian, gay, and transgender youth, which is a very hot topic, very quoted. His papers are still being quoted. So he ended up having Retraction Watch get involved. He's lost a couple jobs, and it, it was really very, very difficult. But I decided as an editor, and I, I know what my previous speaker was talking about, because I chose to call this dean and to speak to this person about these papers, because I felt like it was important. Wiley Blackwell was reluctant, but they said you should follow your lead and do this. So I called her and I told her how he had said that she had instructed him to do an in-service on EndNote, and the woman audibly gasped over the phone. So I knew I had done the right thing. And about three weeks later, I got an email from this dean who stated that the research compliance officer of the university had gotten involved, and that the gentleman had tendered his re resignation from this university. And about five days ago, the Federal Registry sanctioned him. 
because he had NIH funds and his research was proven to be faulty. So I, I share this case because I think what looks like a simple case of publication ethics can mushroom into a much larger issue. And in the interest of full disclosure, 5% of my salary is supported from Shire Pharmaceutical. I should have said that first, but that's, that's the end of this. So what I want to talk about today, after I've told my little story here, is I want to talk about COPE, its purpose, and the ways it can be helpful to you. I want to talk a little about the work of the organization, web resources for editors, the flow charts, which I think all of you could find helpful. And then I want to talk a little bit about exemplar cases of publication ethics. And then I will be in the panel for questions. So why do publications, why does publication ethics matter? Um, published research influences other researchers and changes practice. We all know that. Journal reputations um, are built on editors who are the guardians of the research record. And I think editors have an essential role in fostering research integrity. If we don't foster that research integrity in our writing and in what's published in our journals, who's going to do it? We have to maintain that. So why does research integrity matter? Well, public trust um, certainly exists in research. And I think that the statistics shown in, my pre in the previous presentation about the 283 retractions in Medline in 2010, it's even higher for 2011. There's many retractions going on. And many of these retracted papers <clears throat> continue to be cited or included in systematic reviews after they're retracted. And that's part of the problem, is that they're, they're not systematically reviewed from the research literature. And I'm sure if I pulled up a manuscript about lay, lesbi lay, gay, lesbian, and transgender youth, I would find this gentleman who um, was engaged in so many ethical violations, I'm sure his work is quoted. And there's not a lot we can do about that, but it, it's a problem. So COPE is guided by an elected council. And I need to tell you that I ended up running for this. They invited me to run to be on their, their Committee on Publication um, Ethics Management Group. And it was my nursing colleagues in Inane, which is International Association of Nurse Editors, who probably elected me. Because as, I don't know how many of you are nurses. If, I think a few of you are. You know, nurses kind of rallied to the cause. And so when the email went out that I was running on COPE Council, I ended up getting elected. And I think it was these people that were my fellow editors who did it. And I, I didn't exactly know what I was getting into when I got elected to COPE, but what, what's ended up happening is I have gotten fairly immersed in publication ethics. And I've been to England, I've gone to a couple of meetings, and what I've learned from my involvement in the past year is that publication ethics, number one, it's a hot topic, but number two, every journal editor needs to be concerned about it. And I had someone say to me, actually, at a conference recently that if they never had publication ethics issues in their journal. They just didn't have them. They just didn't exist. And I looked at that person and I said, then you're not looking very hard. You're really not looking for it because they do exist. And we all disciplines are dealing with it, not just in nursing, but in medicine, but the humanities, science, all, all disciplines. In COPE membership, there's 18 of us on the council. We're all made up of very different and diverse um, disciplines. So it's not just one group of people. The current officers are listed. Um, current officers are changing in March as we do new elections. But the council members are considered trustees of COPE as a charity and also directors as COPE is also a limited company in Great Britain. The day-to-day -day management is responsibility of the permanent staff and those people are listed there. And I list them because they're very available for you to contact. So this is a very open group. They're transparent in, in their information and also in their willingness to help. Um, the Code of Conduct is a really important document, and just to summarize it, it talks about editors being responsible for everything that's published in their journals, striving to meet the needs of readers and authors, constant improvement, ensuring quality, champion, championing freedom of expression, maintaining the integrity of the academic record, precluding business needs from compromising intellectual standards, and always being willing to publish corrections, clarifications, retractions, and apologies when needed, which I think most journals are pretty willing to do. Historically, this organization began in 1997 as an information informal forum for discussing ethical issues relating to research and publication in biomedical journal publishing. 
and membership of COPE at that time was aimed primarily but not exclusively at editors, editors of scholarly or learned journals. In 2007 and 8, COPE was more formally established as a limited company and as a UK registered charity. The stated aim is the promotion for the public benefit of ethical standards of conduct in scientific research and the publication of science journals. And in 2007 and 8, the membership increased substantially from around 350 editors to around 3,500. Currently, though, in 2011, I think this is so exciting, COPE has 6,400 members. Many, almost all of the major publishing houses are members. I think maybe all of them are. It's now international in scope and fully inclusive in subject matter. And all academic disciplines and fields are now covered, for example, biomedicine, pure and applied sciences, engineering and technology, and then the arts, humanities, and social sciences. I am, however, the only nurse on the council, first and only nurse on the council. They told me I'm unique and different, which I didn't know quite what to think about that, but <laughs> probably a good thing. So there's several ways COPE is useful for you. And the first way would be the website. And there's a series of flow charts, and I think um, what also is positive is that they're translated into several languages. And we're constantly translating these flow charts into other languages so that you can just tap on, click on a flow chart in Spanish, French, whatever the languages you need. And a code of conduct and best practice guide for journal editors was revised and launched this past March. There was also a code of conduct for publishers and also sample letters for handling common problems for submissions to journals. In other words, if you're an editor that's dealing with someone who you question the authorship issues, they will give you a sample letter that you can take and revise and use as you deal with that author. There's also retraction guidelines, presentations, and then there's other guidance. And I think the other guidance, which is important to all of you, is that you can have a conversation with people at COPE. They're very willing to talk to you. They're very willing to hook you up with somebody who's on the council. And then they also have the forums where the cases are, are presented. And I'll get into that in a moment. These are the issues of publication ethics that the flowcharts systematically cover. And as you can see, it covers a lot of the issues that we might deal with. Um, I think an important one is general suspected ethical concerns. I think there's many times when journal editors might wonder if there's an ethics issue but not really be certain about that. And so that's, that's one area that I think is important. Um, so COPE gives advice and guidance to members and it offers advice and guidance primarily through its quarterly forum of meetings. We're getting ready to have a forum meeting in San Diego the end of October. Um, twice a year they're held in London, but we can, this is not a good, this is not successful, but we try to participate in teleconference. The technology has not caught up to the need. It's a little tough. It keeps going in and out to try to teleconference to England. But the forum does allow members to benefit from the views and experience of other members. And forum meetings are recorded and the audio is published with a summary of the case on the website. So I want to talk a little bit about some of the latest misconduct in the news. And I think it, it was mentioned previously about the issue of the Andrew Winfield's research around um, MMR immunizations. We talked at dinner last night about how many people still believe that immunizations will hurt children and will hurt their child. And it's just simply not true. It was, it was completely falsified in terms of the data. But it was a very notorious um, piece that came out in Lancet, and Lancet certainly dealt with that. Another was um, a gentleman who had published 21 studies on post-op pain and orthopedic surgery that were completely untrue, that affected practice in many, many orthopedic departments. And there was no, there was no data to support it. <laughs> and he, it's, as it says here, this gentleman was at the forefront of redesigning pain management protocols with his carefully planned and meticulously documented research. Only problem was it didn't happen. It, it was not done. So COPE also can give you advice and guidance, and this is a quote from Philip Steer from the British Journal of Obstetrics and Gynecology. I have a feeling I don't have to convince you all that COPE could be helpful. I think I'm preaching to the choir here a little bit. But just to know the way COPE works, all cases are entered into a COPE database, 
And all the cases and subsequent COPE recommendations are available at the website, and cases are searchable by keyword. So if you have a particular issue and you want to see if COPE has it in their history, you can go back into that if your journal is a member. I, I gave you some of the um, pictures. You don't have to look at these carefully, but um, these are certainly some of the, the website looks that you can go into. But this talks about cases over time, and it gives you some of the information around the different types of ethical issues and how many cases have come up. And certainly, um, I hear that 2010-11 has been a banner year for COPE, so I think the number is greater than 93 for the total, but this is just an informational slide. COPE can also help editors with complaints, advice, and guidance. Um, individuals can be, bring complaints against COPE members if they consider that they have not followed the Code of Conduct. conduct. COPE will only consider a complaint after all appropriate internal mechanisms at the journal have been exhausted. And what I have to say about that is I've been really impressed by the um, political <coughs> delicacy of the council members, and I don't know if that's because it's a British organization or if that's just because they're just so careful about not offending people, getting all the data, figuring out exactly what's going on. And we've had a number of cases recently where one journal editor complained against another journal editor about things that were published in the journals. I think, I think those are kind of touchy, but they have very systematically handled those complaints and sorted them through. COPE does not adjudicate on the merits of individual cases. Um, for example, whether publication misconduct has occurred, but simply on whether the COPE member followed appropriate procedures. In the publication ethics violation issue that I was involved with, um, we were meticulous in following COPE guidelines. We were very upfront with this author that we were following COPE guidelines as we dealt with him. So there's also, as, as I said before, it does not judge on authorship disputes or editorial decisions such as acceptance or rejection. Um, it does have an ombudsman to arbitrate on cases where a complainant is unhappy with COPE's response and COPE can only offer advice if the journal is a member of COPE, which means the publishing company needs to be. So COPE has other services, um, the website, the newsletter, which is quarterly, an annual seminar. I don't know how many of you have gone into the website, but it's a real tre treasure trove of information. It could be very helpful, I think, to anybody who goes into it. They have published a number of documents, including ethical editing, and then promoting integrity and in research publication. So the planned services for 2011 include a number of things. They've just launched the beginnings of an e-learning program, which will be finalized on Friday and will be available. And I think what's important about this is as I talk to my fellow editors and I talk to other faculty members in graduate programs, at least in nursing, they all have said that they feel they need more education within their curriculum about publication ethics that there's not enough of it. And I spoke to veterinary editors in St. Louis this past summer, and one of their leaders, Mary Christopher, had just gone to Egypt, and she said she was appalled about the lack of knowledge in veterinarians who were in academic settings about publication ethics. And what that raises is that the need for some standard and for some international consistency in terms of what that means, and there needs, but on a local level, there needs to be more education in our graduate programs because I'm not sure everybody was raised quite the way I was, where you know right from wrong. And I remember faculty back in my undergraduate talking about how you publish things and you don't steal things and you don't plagiarize and you don't steal it. I don't know if people get that or not. Uh, the first Asian Pacific seminars just happened in Australia, and the second one is the end of October in San Diego. Um, so there's also going to be a launch of a new website within the next six weeks. And then I'm part of the development of an international advisory board, which has meant that we've invited five people from different parts of the world who could give us consultation about publication ethics issues that are occurring in another culture. Now, I'm not so up on the publication ethics issues that might happen in Taiwan or in Japan, and we have appointed people who are gonna help us with that, who have agreed to, to be part of that advisory board. So the support for members is that you can bring cases to the COPE Forum, um, minutes of the forums with podcasts of the case discussions are available online. It's free attendance at COPE seminars, really all over the world. You have access to COPE resources, and you have support for editors via email and telephone. 
and the good public relations of supporting the only international group devoted to publica publication ethics is very important. So another way that COPE provides support is it can encourage responses from authors or institutions, and it makes negotiations easier for editors and adds the weight of an outside body. So we always ask how can we improve our support for our members. We're committed to improving communication about activities and encouraging debate about publication ethics. And some of the areas that are going to be um, improved this year will be we have more brochures and leaflets for use at conferences, further improvement of the website's functionality, and then a LinkedIn page for code. So finally, we want your views and we want to know how we can improve our service. And the feedback is essential. Um, but I, again, I don't think I could have gone through the whole publications ethics drama that I dealt with 18 months ago if I hadn't had COPE providing those boundaries and those levels of support for me because it, I was asleep over this guy. I was really distressed, really upset over these falsified references. And I see people shaking their heads. Some folks might think that's really kind of dumb that you worry about ethic and an ethics violation, but it was very distressing and it, it was disturbing to me. So what it's done for me personally though as a journal editor is that within about six weeks of this we got um, a link, we got the um, cross-check system and I authenticate. So now the manuscripts are checked. It's easier to look at manuscripts in terms of plagiarism, falsified references, because it all pops up. You see that. And we also, I, I have to admit, I'm looking more carefully at references of manuscripts that are submitted to me, which I did before, but I don't think I did it carefully enough. So it brought home to me the need to really be aware of everything that gets published in my journal under my name. I just have given you contact details. I think you can get this presentation. So all these different contact details um, will all work. They're all current. And we'll save our questions. And I've, LaShawn will be happy with me because it comes up on time. We probably have time for one question. Does anybody have one question that they want to ask? Yes? Well, I asked that question. The question was, why would somebody mess with their references? And you know, I asked him that question because when I called him up with my managing editor, he said that there was a pressure to publish within his university setting, and so his graduate students must have added the year and the, the years to the date and the volume. But the problem was is that when my managing editor sent him back the corrected version of the manuscript to his address, he put it back to the falsified version and sent it back again. Well, why? He said that more current references would result in a publication. Mm -hmm. That's what he said. He's a sick guy. He's not. He's not. <laughs> sick. Okay. So well, thank you very much, and you can ask questions when I sit at the front. <laughs>